Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. What do a riot-torn, futuristic Los Angeles, a members-only hospital for criminals, an incredible cast made up of, let's do this, Sterling K. Brown, Brian Tyree Henry, Zachary Quinto, Jeff Goldblum, Jody Foster, Dan Bautista, Sophie Batella, Charlie Day, and if you look fast, Father John Misty all have in common. It is Drew Pierce's wild new future noir, Hotel Artemis. Let's take a look at a clip. Dad, mm. I, I know that I'm the youngest, that maybe I never... I really earned your respect. But if you don't make it, I need you to know that I'll always remember the thing you told me the day I turned 16. You said, go confidently in the direction of your dreams. But my only dream has ever been to be more like you. I'm sorry, Chris. Because it's... Bullshit like that that made you grow up so fucking soft. However, if I don't make it out of here, this is for you. All right. Take any talk. Family time's over. Yeah. Come on. Take this. Apply pressure. If the time comes, I hope you know what the fuck to do with that. Everybody, please welcome director, writer, Drew Pierce, and Zachary Quinto. I guess that answers the question, can we swear in this interview? Yes, you can yeah. swear. Um, let's, let's talk about, we'll talk broadly about the film and you know, where, where this, this crazy idea came from, but since we saw that clip and that scene, let's talk about executing that scene, which is an incredibly hard scene to execute in a movie. It's in the middle of a ton of chaos that's going on, and you drop into a monologue that has a very direct comedic punchline, which you don't see coming right away. It's executed perfectly, but can you talk about writing that and shooting that? It's not an easy thing to, I feel like, have confidence in knowing that it's gonna work because it is in the midst of so much other stuff happening. Yeah, um, uh, the gate, as that became known as, was always the kind of dread zone because it turns out that shooting up and down a room that has a big thing in the middle <laughs> is not perfect for cinema. Um, and you know, and one of the things that people don't realize is with this little movie that shot for like 33 days in downtown LA last summer, that amazing people like Zach, uh, like just came and were part of the gang. Um, and so, for example, Goldblum was in for three days. So you've got to get everyone up and running really fast. Then you're you're jamming to get. Uh, the the movie just to get what you need that day. So honestly, like the thing was preparation, which is the most boring answer I can humanly give. But um, it was it was the only way to do it. And the weird thing is, you prepare and prepare and prepare, and then on the day you throw it all away and you follow the actors and uh, you follow what the room is doing. How do you prepare for a monologue like that in a, in a scene like that? Because it is. Well, I learned my lines. Right. <laughs> He really did. Um, you play it as realistically as possible? Yeah. Or just play the drama of it and let the joke sort of land how it oh, lands? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, we talked a lot about who Crosby is and what his um, mindset is, you know, that he's probably like the, you know, fifth or sixth kid of Goldblum's character. And uh, he, he wants to be taken much more seriously than he is. And, you know, this is an opportunity for him to really prove his mettle and take care of his dad because, you know, presumably all of his other siblings are off doing whatever they're doing in their fabulous lives. And He's the Eric Trump, if you he's will. He's the Eric Trump of the, of the of Hotel Artemis world. It's very true. Um, so, you know, I feel like uh, the, the, that moment, that exchange was really rooted in that desire to be seen by his father who sees him for you know, the the loser that he is, in a way, you know? Yeah. Um, was, yeah. And Goldblum is so Goldblum. I mean, he's just... He's basically like, Sinatra at this point. He is it's literally... Like, sometimes I have to remind him to be less Goldblum and be more, <laughs> Gold, be more Wolf King. He is truly... Uh, you know, I had never met Jeff before. He was everything I had hoped and more in terms of... Um, just how present he is and how fun he is and how much he loves what he does. And so it was also really fun to work with him. Yeah, and he that is the thing. It's like he was in for three days. He wasn't getting paid. Um, and, uh, and he showed up and just gave it everything. And I think it was fun for him because he doesn't usually play a bad guy. 
And that's one of the ways that I got this amazing cast to, to come and make the movie with me is um, I think kind of by casting sometimes against, if not type, then what someone's been doing for like the last few years. And it just made it more delicious for people to kind of sink their teeth into for a few days. I imagine Goldblum is a little bit like walking at a certain point where it's almost hard for him to not do a read or a line with a certain cadence. That's just you would imagine is. correctly. <laughs> but I think there's, I mean, I, I, I just having watched him, uh, you know, there is this kind, I mean, he, he is so indelibly himself, uh, but, but there is this like creative integrity and appetite that is, and not that Christopher Walken doesn't have that, certainly he does, but but that Jeff is really like like he would he 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 riffs in his mind. I mean, he's a jazz musician. You know, this is That's another so thing that true. I learned about him through this process. We went to see him play live jazz in L.A. while we were shooting the movie, and you know, he he Any really good? No, I'm yeah, amazing. <laughs> he has the mind of a you know he his his mind is that of a of a jazz musician, and so he riffs on things. You know, and we'd be talking, and he'd be like, I think you know we should do Death of a Salesman. Like I want to do Death of a Salesman. You know, and then he'd, he'd start reciting lines lines of Willie Loman before Drew yells action and get himself into this emotional place that, you know, is Willie Loman, but then that he would kind of put into the Wolf King in this moment. I mean, it was... And sometimes he's singing before yeah, a yeah. take. He's often... And, and then as a director, you have to kind of adapt to that and work with it. So I found that, like, giving him... Uh, esoteric direction uh, really helped. Uh -huh. So when we were doing... There's a scene which is particularly dark for his character. And, uh, you know, one of the ways I would, would get him there is each time I would have to, you know, usually, you know, when you're working with an incredible cast, it really is a case of, like, a little smaller, a little bigger, a little faster, you know. Um, whereas with Jeff, it was like, okay, this time, I mean, to imagine you're one of those kind of Irish drunks that four drinks in just turns and becomes evil. And he's like, yeah, ah. Oh. I got it. Um, and, uh, and he does that literally like he's playing jazz or listening to a meter. Um, and, uh, and then he's just in it. He actually literally grabs it. I, I do think he's it. like playing the cadences, like as he's, he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You said that you cast a lot of people against type or against maybe what they've played before. Did you feel that way with your character? You're playing not just the son of this sort of criminal, but kind of a thug or like a, a, a futuristic hood. Yeah. I, I did respond to that aspect of it. You know, I felt like there was a kind of hyper masculine, uh, you know, facade that this character was putting up, um, and I and I liked that aspect of it. You know, um, he was trying. Uh, a lot of the characters that I've played, I feel like, are very internal, uh, and and I, I felt that was not the case with Crosby, who's very much about what he's showing the world even though it's kind of anathema to who he really is. And he's not um, that smart, so he's kind yeah, of brutish exactly. consistently. Yeah. Yeah. Usually my characters are brilliant. Um, I'm casting you against that. Not because yeah. I know you better. Um, I think there's also an interesting thing, which is when you give every character in the movie as much as possible, um, uh, not just an angle, but a life, which I know should be a given, but isn't necessarily, um, then it gets to inform everything that they do. So uh, Zach's choices you know, with me for costume were about a guy, a specific kind of LA rich kid who's trying to prove their authenticity and their toughness. Um, and, uh, and the same goes for even moments in a fight sequence. Because you're looking for character, then, you know, there are a couple of beats in the, you know, one of the fights that you're in, which are completely about character rather than just like a generic badass beat. Um, and th it's really important. And if you, if you remember to do that, then I think even though, you know, it's like a tight movie with nine central characters, you can give people enough each time that they really hold on to something. I mean, uh, speaking of casting against type, Sterling K. Brown does not really cry. In this movie, he does cry a bit, <laughs> a bit. Yeah. But I was waiting for it. There's the moment where it's really supposed it should happen, and he yeah. and he was restrained. I was like, good for him. They let him do a scene where but he didn't have the, to cry. Here's the weird thing with Sterling is that like he, he's gave, a great he gave me all the sizes of cry, like from full cry to no cry, and I went with like you know partial cry. I, I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a but that's I mean he's so 
um, you can tell that his background is the stage and, and, and classical training because like he's one of those guys that goes click and just like switches it on. And it really helps that he and Brian Tyree Henry, who plays his brother Honolulu in the movie, have I think 14 years. Yeah, they were like as best a friendship. friends for years. Yeah. yeah. I just saw Brian Tyree Henry in The Lobby Hero, uh, and and Sterling was there. We went to the closing show, and you know I never met Brian while we were filming the movie. So after the show, when I said hi to him, we had a whole like, we're in a movie together, but <laughs> we've never met. But that's what's crazy uh, is like, we had to, bl like, yeah. we've never had, and we probably will never have the us. whole yeah. cast together, except in the movie itself. And on some level, that's a bit sad for me. But on another level, it kind of makes the movie magic in its own way, because it feels like they're all there in one night. Can you talk about, it's a, it's a kind of a lame question, but because this is such a strange movie in terms of where it came from, and you're obviously operating on some neo-noir type of thing when it comes to the dialogue and a lot of the lighting, but what made you want to do, or where did you come up with this idea for a, a hospital in a futuristic riot set L.A.? It's a mixture of a bunch of things, really, and that's how I tend to find my ideas come together. I, you know, I... Usually when I come up with an idea, and this was like, I don't know, when I was doing Iron Man 3 in 2011, I scribbled, you know, Bad Guys Hospital or something equally lame. Um, and I was like, mm, it could be good. Um, and so, <laughs> and when I have an idea that feels sticky, I start a little notebook, I start a playlist, and I start a Dropbox. Great and, songs in this, by the way. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. Great soundtrack. Yeah, no, I mean, it, that was the LA of it is really important. And that's one of the things that went into the pot. And one of the other things is, I kind of miss the movies that I would watch as a teenager, where um, I think small and large movies now have a slight sense of like the, the sharp edges being filed off. Um, and certainly I've worked as a screenwriter on a lot of you know, very big films. And you try and make them absolutely brilliant. But what they have to be on, a, on just like a baseline level is okay for everyone. And, and going That's in, so interesting because one of the things, know, I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. one of the things that I remember loving about Iron Man 3 as opposed to most of the other Iron Mans and superhero movies, no offense to all of them, I'm sure you all love them, uh, was that the sharp edges were still kind of there. Oh yeah, even we got was, away with murder. Yeah, even though it was still, I think, PG-13, it still had these sort of like crazy plot strands yeah. that went places that were tangential that you didn't expect and were funny in odd ways, which you don't see in most of those movies. No, and I think it's... Look, without wishing to go down the rabbit hole of sounding like pretentious first-time director, which I am perfectly capable of doing, um, uh, there's an... This stage is four, go ahead. Oh, I'm home. <laughs> and you can uh, curse while doing it. I know. Um, uh, like, there's a weird thing you see in Korean films that you don't see as much in Western films, which is, like, and I think, you know, Korean movies over the last 10 years have been, like, a massive influence on me. Um, and that's partly why there's loads of color in Hotel Artemis, you know, because I feel like my generation are kind of moving past that desaturated thing. But there's a really interesting thing that Korean movies in particular do tonally, which is they're totally unafraid to be like heavy drama one moment, um, broad comedy, ultra violence, incredibly sincere emotion, even in the same scene, let alone the same 20 minutes. And that kind of zigzag is something I... I really enjoy because I find it surprising and I think if you, it's tough to pull off, but if you can pull it off, then then everyone, then you kind of get the whole meal. Um, and that's for, good. for my money, Bong Joon-ho is probably the greatest working director right now and is totally unsung because he's Korean and because his movies veer in all of these crazy directions. I think a lot of people don't really understand them. Yeah. yeah. But is that who you're referring to? Or you uh, yeah, like, and Director Park. Yeah. Um, like, you know... Uh, the Handmaiden, and I, so I was really lucky. We got to, we got to work with Chung Hoon Chung, who is Director Park's cinematographer. Wow. Um, and that was weird. It was because, like, look, the script, for whatever reason, this one stuck, and it was interesting to actors, and it was also interesting to a whole bunch of, you know, artists behind the camera as well, which was good, because, like, they needed to be interested, because there was absolutely bugger all money. And, um, and so I was meeting with... Uh, like really great young cinematographers, really great established cinematographers. And about halfway through the process, I realized that about a third of the reference pictures I was showing them were all shot by the same guy, and that was Chung Hoon Chung. And I was like, maybe I should meet him. Um, and it's interesting for a guy whose movies are, you know, beautiful, 
um, and kind of poetic often. He is the most ridiculous man in person. Like, he's the funniest guy you will meet. Um, he's, he's unbelievably fast, and, you know, he helped make a movie in 33 days, which is incredible. Now, one of the people that we haven't mentioned in, uh, in terms of the cast is Jodie Foster, who is probably the one person who gets to interact with every other actor at some point in it. Uh, Zach, what was it like working with Jodie Foster in this? Because she's doing a different kind of performance than I think she she's is, ever done. Yeah. I mean, she's, uh, I've been such an admirer of hers for so long. Um, and it was a real thrill to get uh, the chance to work with her. I feel a sense of kind of kindred with her. I mean, she's, she brings her uh, intelligence, her intellect to the work. And that's something that I feel like I relate to in a way, you know? Um, and she's just really cool. She's smart. She's funny. She's easy to talk to. She's, she's great been doing it for in the film. Yeah, years. she's been yeah. at it for like a, a long yeah. time, and uh, and she has such an innate sense of this character and and how to physicalize her and how to bring her to life in a way that's really identifiable and accessible. And yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, it was a real pleasure to, to get to work with her and to get to know her a little bit. Yeah, and I have to say, like, you know, one of the greatest compliments for the movie is, you know, there's a terrifying day when uh, I had to show Jodie the film, that she had 80 ADR lines or something like that. And she's also a great director. I mean, in that's her own the right, thing. Right. And so she sits in the edit bay and I kind of poke my head in at the end and she was just like, it's really good. And, uh, uh, and from then on, she's just been this incredible supporter of it you know um and and of all the actors in it um you know one of her whole things is that everyone is great in the movie and and that's tough because like it, there's only so much oxygen to go around and i think it's one of the reasons that works is because all of the actors were smart enough to find their place in the film and uh, and own it well i think you as a writer also gave every actor their moment you know, it's a big ensemble, but you gave each, you made sure each character had a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, I mean, story. I think the first time you see a character is one of the most important things you can do. Um, and, you know, for example, with your character, like, I really reveal you slowly and enigmatically. Um, I think how a character leaves the movie is really important, whether it's a happy leaving or a sad leaving or a, or a violent end. Um, and, uh, and then I think you absolutely need to make sure every one of them has a story. And, I mean, I know this sounds basic 101 stuff but often when you're making like big movies like you've made as well because the machine is so giant it's hard to keep hold of the idea that everyone needs a story like the trains left the station and people are just like trying to keep it on the tracks with a smaller movie like this where i had the time to prepare and where i had, I had the time to write and rewrite it and then rewrite it again when the actors came on board to to modify it to their voices um, or their, you know, their input. Like, I ran towards the idea of a kind of daddy's boy because that was something that when we had our first Skype, you really held on to. I was like, great, I'll just dig in. Um, and so, yeah. I also held on to the idea of a gold tooth. Oh, the gold tooth. Which, like, I was like, you never see it. But I had like a <laughs> yeah. full on like tooth. I was like, let's do some physical things. We came up with that tattoo. Oh, yeah, the tattoo. Neck tats. But also, yeah. and also, I Haircut, love that, right? There's like a, a sort of a buzz kind of thing going There's on. There's a as real well. buzz thing. We had a, we had a on, the yeah. one thing that we had was a, an on set barber. We did. Amazing. We did. I mean, that's only because I need my fade clean every it's day. It's really so, good. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you, man. I appreciate it. It's really it. good. Um, someone uh, said I looked like um, like I was from the, the, the alt right. And I was like, well, that wasn't <laughs> actually the look I was going for. So thank you very much but um no there was and there's a there's a you know weirdly the tooth is a beautiful thing for zach to bring up because one of the one of the not having any money aspects of it was i mean zach paid for his tooth because i couldn't afford it uh dave bautista has a neck tattoo i mean all the rest of his tattoos are models own but like he wanted a neck tattoo because he his background as a character is uh east side la gangster that kind of then, you know, started helping people. Um, and I was like, mate, I just can't afford a tattoo or the person putting it on every morning. Dave paid for it. And weirdly, even the masks. <laughs> so the mask was the very first day of shooting. And two days before it, um, I, my props master sent me a photo. And I was like, yeah, they look really cool. Um, when are the finished ones going to be ready? And he was like, no, these are the finished ones. I was like... They're made of fucking cardboard. 
um, he was like, it's all I can afford, man. So I ended up having to put the masks on my credit card to 3D print them, which I always thought like, well, this is fine because we'll do reshoots and then I'll rent them back to the, uh, to the movie. Turned out we couldn't afford reshoots either. So, uh, so if anyone wants a skull mask, hit me up. Uh, Zach, you mentioned uh, Broadway and going to the closing show for Lobby Hero. You are opening a show tomorrow night, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, the boys in the band with uh, an incredible cast and... Um, it's a it's a, a great off Broadway play from the '60s that then became a Friedkin movie, and now you guys are bringing it back. Yeah, this is the first time the play's been on Broadway. Um, we open officially Thursday, I guess, but our press opening is tomorrow. Um, Excuse me, Thursday. No, no, that's okay. It's a it's a weird thing that they're doing with this one for um, anyway. So yeah, but. Uh, but we've been in previews for al almost a month now, and uh, it's been a blast. We're having a really great time. We're at the Booth Theater uh, on 45th, between Broadway and 8th. And uh, we run until the middle of August. And uh, yeah, it's an incredible experience. I mean, there's nothing to me like doing a play. It's like my favorite my favorite uh, experience, so I'm... Have you uh, done a bunch of Broadway stuff? Uh, this is my second Broadway play. I did uh, The Glass Menagerie in 2013 uh, in the same theater, actually, at the booth. Um, and I've done a bunch of off-Broadway stuff. I did Angels in America in 2010 and uh, play at MCC at the Lucy Lortel a couple of years ago. So I've done a lot of theater. I did theater in L.A. before. and um, So, I, I mean, yeah, if I could only do theater, I would. You know, except, yeah. except for my movies, except for Drew's movies, Thank of you. course. Thank you. Of course. No, but yeah, if I if I could, you know, have the same diversity of experience and make the same living doing theater, I would do it all. I mean, you know, it's it's just there's nothing like it, you know, and um, and it really suits me, and, and I'm having a blast. You play Harold, the uh, the person who's sort of big party. It right. is uh, a big birthday party, kind of depressed about getting a little bit older, right? Yeah. I'm not super familiar with the work. It's Oddly, one of the few Friedkin things that have passed uh -huh. through that I haven't seen. Yeah. Uh, a blind spot for me. But um, one, one of the things that I've heard from the play is because it was written uh, about the gay community in the sort of late 60s, right. mid to late 60s, right? There are some things, while it's a celebration at the same time, there are like some dated references that well, everyone sort yeah. of has, gets to play with and, and, yeah. and talk I mean, about. The play was revolutionary at the time. It premiered in 1968 off-Broadway. Uh, it was a huge hit. Nobody had seen anything like it. It was the first American play that really explored the landscape of uh, gay psychology, gay relationships. Um, and, um, and, and it was a huge hit. It ran for over two years. Um, they made the Friedkin movie. But this interesting thing happened, which is that between the time when the play premiered in 1968 and when the movie came out in 1970, Stonewall happened. So there was this, it, it really captured this very small window into the gay experience, right, which was before the liberation movement um, and before the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and, and when the movie came out, because Stonewall had already happened, there was this backlash against the material, against the film primarily, because obviously more people saw the film. Um, and they felt like it was reductive and backward looking and stereotyping. And, um, and so to do it 50 years later and to see how far we've come in that amount of time uh, is pretty incredible. But to also see the echoes of uh, the relationship between the gay community or the LGBTQ community at large and mainstream society and social political points of view and perspectives is pretty powerful. It's actually an incredible moment, I think, to be telling this story and to be bringing it to, um, to audiences. It's an all uh, openly gay cast, myself, Jim Parsons, Andrew Reynolds, Matt Bomer, uh, Michael Benjamin Washington, Charlie Carver, Tuck Watkins, Robin DeJesus, Brian Hutchison. Um, it's a really incredible group of people who've come together. Uh, all of us have our own journeys, our own experiences, our own accomplishments, our own careers. And, you know, mostly the original cast of the film uh, had a really difficult time integrating and reconciling themselves as people um, to the careers that they wanted to build and the kinds of actors that they wanted to be. And so Ryan Murphy's producing this production. Uh, it's directed by two time Tony Award winning Joe Mantello. There's a, there's a lot of great energy around it. And uh, 
And the spirit in which we've all come together is a spirit of declaration, a spirit of authenticity, and a spirit of um, holding a mirror up to audiences to show them exactly where we are in relation to where we were 50 years ago and in relation to where we need to be, which is still you know, a ways off. Absolutely. Uh, let's get some questions for the audience. Who has a question? I really hope none of the questions are, um, uh, Chris Pine, you've really let yourself go. Um, <laughs> what the fuck happened? Uh, hi. Uh, so you both of you guys have worked on some uh, action films, like mostly maybe PG-13. Uh, was it any different doing uh, an R-rated, uh, more violent uh, action film or uh, filming any of the scenes? I mean, I'm quite sweary anyway. You might have spotted. Um, uh, actually, the, 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 there's only one problem, which is when you bring, when you open that door, there's a world where everybody, every actor, f bombs in every single line, um, because we're in a heightened world, and you know the, everyone's in the zone. Everyone is in that kind of like terror zone, and most people would swear constantly, particularly these characters in that situation. So. Uh, Kenneth Choi is in the uh, is in the movie, mm. and honestly, one of the uh, one of the first jobs I had with the first ten minutes of the movie was to defuck it because literally he would say the word like four times in each line, um, and so so that's the only downside to it. The upside of it is that I think uh, look, I love Mamet and I love the the rhythm of swearing when it's, the, when it's used correctly and the emphasis of it. So, I, you know, it's just one of the things that I enjoy as a tool to play with. Did you like swearing? I, I did swear a lot. Yeah, I feel like, you know, it is true when the, when, the, when the lid is off and you're allowed to swear, you tend to add swear words in much more than they're written. Uh, if you're in the moment, yeah, I think, as well, that's, yeah. that's the other thing. And, and, and particularly Crosby's so, um, you know, he's, he's uh, angst-ridden and, and uh, tightly wound, and there's a lot of, you know, where's my father and what the fuck's going on in there. Kind yeah, of there's stuff, a kind of sad know. desperation to him, yeah. and there's that thing of, like, trying to prove how tough he is yeah, as well, exactly. and that kind of plays yeah. into the so swearing as well. I did find myself swearing more than the script called for, but... It Drew worked, worked around perfectly. it. Drew worked around it. So they liked swearing. We Next did. question. <laughs> I, I love that question. that's the takeout yeah. from today. In conclusion. If you like swearing, you're going to love Hotel Artemis. Hey, uh, what will you each take away from working with each other going forward? Oh, true. Mine's an easy one, which is uh, write a role for Zach in everything yeah. I do. That's so good. I'll take it. Drew's got such a great spirit of... He, joy. I mean, he loves what he does. And I was really, you know, I, I've worked with first time directors before, both as an actor and a producer. Um, and it was really great to see um, that everything was a, a, was a, every challenge was an opportunity to solve something rather than an opportunity to feel like he was being limited or um, I, I really loved watching that. It was about how can I creatively come up with a solution. Uh, he was happy to make his movie, to tell his story. And, you know, there's a lot of people who I feel uh, have a sense of entitlement or a sense in, you know, considering the other work Drew's done, you could see how he'd be one of those people that, well, what do you mean I can't, I, I need more, I need, you know, and, and rather than that perspective, I feel like he made the absolute most with what he had, and, and it's a beautiful film as a result. Thank you, man. Um, I think one of the things you need to do as a first-time director, maybe as a director generally, um, is, is leave your insecurity at the door. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that is the one thing that will kill you every time, particularly if you're a writer, director, and you're you know, in any way holding on to, you just have to let it all go. And, and that's, that's the thing, and the way you do that is you listen to the people that you're working with. You listen to all their ideas. You may not use every one of them, but you really properly listen to them. Ask yourself very honestly, whether this is the right thing, or whether it's, it, or whether it's an evolution of the thing you have and could make it even better, and um, and that's exactly what we did. Like we built a bigger character than was on the page because Zach brought a bunch of stuff to it, and I said, yes, that's better than what I wrote. Let's do that. 
Uh, guys, congratulations on the film. It's like you said, it's beautiful. It's filled with action. It's incredibly funny. Great work. Uh, it opens June 8th, right? Yeah. And Boys in the Band is this Thursday. Opens on yeah. Broadway. And you have a show coming out as well called In Search That's Up. That's true. I do. Yeah. You are filling the shoes once again of Leonard I am. Nimoy. Why well, stop now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In Search Up was a series that was on in the late 70s, early 80s, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. And they came to me and asked if I'd be interested in, in remaking it. Uh, so I, I produce the show and I'm the host of it, and uh, it, it's been a real adventure. We, I actually, one of the things Leonard was very much in the studio uh, in the original series, you know, in a turtleneck and a blazer. Generally, Did you wearing a turtleneck. Uh, and I a blazer? don't. I don't wear a turtleneck. One of the things that I said was, if I'm going to redo it, I want to go on the ground to these places and be involved in the searches. So I got to travel all around the world. Uh, we were in Australia and the UK and Greece and Italy and Morocco and. Uh, and we did 10 episodes that start airing uh, the end of July on History. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about that as well. A lot of good stuff. Uh, but for now, Hotel Artemis, yes, June, 8th, June 8th, Boys in the Band, this Thursday on Broadway. Everybody, please give them a big round of applause. Drew Pearson, Zachary Quintel.